Hey everyone, what is going on? Welcome back here at Young and Investing. In today's video, we are going to talk with the one and only Nicholas Martin. And of course, you know him, he is, has the biggest YouTube channel in the crypto space called Data Dash. So Nicholas, it's very good to talk to you again. How are you doing, man? Quentin, it's good to see you, man. I'm doing great. I just got back from a trip abroad, so back in the States and uh, eager to kind of get your thoughts on everything going on in DeFi and just catch up. Yeah, definitely. That's what we're going to talk about today, right? So, uh, Nicholas, um, most people know you from your YouTube channel, Data Dash, of course, but you have been doing some other stuff lately, right? So maybe guide us through what you have been doing, because I already presented Digifox a little bit on my channel to the viewers. So I think some will already know about it, but some don't. So please explain a little bit what the story is from Digifox. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, uh, over the last year, year and a half, I've kind of had this concept and been working on building a final product called Digifox. It's basically an all-in-one application for your financial services and financial needs. Uh, we're built off of the Ethereum blockchain, so it's an Ethereum smart contract wallet. Very fancy term for basically abstracting traditional private key management and having to pay gas fees with Ethereum. So basically making where we can get cryptocurrencies to be much more mainstream for the average user. And our big focus is obviously tapping into DeFi. I think last time we met in person, Quentin, it was back in 2019 mm -hmm. when we were in Utrecht in, uh, in the Netherlands. <clears throat> and I was just constantly fascinated about the lending pools that were coming in the crypto space, the decentralized exchanges. And now we're at this point where people are finally using them. And yeah. you start to see this, you're seeing a dynamic where like the exchanges, the centralized exchanges are trying to play catch up and they're trying to like get a piece of the DeFi action, but all the liquidity, all the volume, all the excitement, it's going towards, you know, AMMs or automated market makers yeah. and Uniswap, you know, so it's very, very fascinating. Yeah, I think like you started with with your application because of course it's it's some DeFi application as well. There is a lot of, of, of DeFi as well in there, like lending and stuff as well. So um, I think you started with that on the exact right time. I mean, it was like, I think just before the absolute hype started with like the compound thing. In my opinion, this was like the start. And I think Digifox was just before that, right? So I think the timing was very much on point, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it was definitely like a, a, a time in the making. Basically, I was working on it. And then right as we launched, I think in June, a week later, that's as you mentioned, Compound was mm -hmm. the first one to kind of catch the craze around yield farming. So after that, I mean, it just DeFi started going vertical in this yeah. case. And I was like, thank God, like we're on the market right now. And we were able to get a good amount of users in our first two weeks. We got like 5,000 users, which was like far beyond anything I thought we would get. Uh, but it's a lot amazing. of them are coming from the YouTube community and stuff. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate it, man. I appreciate it as well. You've been willing to share it and stuff. And I think more than anything, I'm really interested to see the more substantial long-term version of DeFi come out. There's a lot of craziness right now, which I know we'll probably dive into and, and just try to break down some of the complexity of it all. But I think more than anything, you know, the opportunity to get some better yield on your savings, the ability to make swaps over decentralized exchanges instead of centralized exchanges, it just opens up so much opportunity. And I think as well, um, making crypto payments mainstream as well is something that I'm really interested in. Yeah, definitely. And how many users you have right now? Because you mentioned 5,000 in the first two weeks. That's that's really impressive. So how many now? Yeah, so in regards to the actual user base, we have 11,000 like total downloads of the application in cool. this case. Yeah, it's already um, a nice start. Yeah, yeah, and the sense of smart contract wallet generations where um, there's some users now in, we, in our recent update where some users will be on um, a smart contract wallet, which costs money to deploy. So now we're charging for it in that case, um, just to cover the actual underlying expense because it's really expensive with where gas fees are. Yeah. <laughs> on the other end, yeah, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Kind of like, but it's like, and on the other end though, we also have this this free form of Digifox where you can tap into Celsius, you can buy major amount of cryptocurrencies, and it's completely free. Um, and in that case, so uh, we have a few uh, additional users who are doing that method as well. So I think we have around like 7,000, 800 smart contract wallet generations, something around that ballpark. That's nice. That's a very good yeah. start. I mean, like in a, in a few months of time, that's 
That's uh, very nice. And I also saw that you have uh, recently hired some new people as well. So the team is expanding too. So I think you're on track to do something very nice. And I am fully supportive on that because I think it's an amazing application. I was, I tested a little bit um, and I think it's nice because you can also see like in the traditional financial markets, the all-in-one solutions that are very easy to use where, where everything is integrated, they are getting very popular. So maybe it's going to be the same for Digifox. Let's hope so, right? Yeah, man. I think what you found is there's a lot of fintech apps out there where they did like one specific thing. So you have like the Robin Hoods of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's other applications that basically service one specific financial need, Coinbase as well. And the thing is, is that some of them, I don't think all of them, but some of them, as you mentioned, Quinn, they're kind of realizing, well, wait a minute, like, you know, you, you cap out your user growth potential if you just do one thing, right? Because then they're going to go to another application that does this other thing. Why can't you offer a second or third or fourth service? And it's, that's our whole goal is to basically build an all-in-one finance app from the get-go. It just makes it extremely simple for everyday users. That's awesome. But uh, how, how much of your time do you now spend like on Digifox? Because I'm thinking like right now, the, the, the crypto markets are, there's so much things happening that personally, it's very hard to, to do like um, YouTube and the, some other side projects, which I'm currently doing as well. And there will be more information about that very soon. But uh, I mean, for me, it's like very hard to keep it up, like the pace of doing YouTube, following the markets and the side stuff. So I don't know how you do it, but yeah, you still upload every day, right? Or nearly yeah. every day, most of the times. Yeah, I try to do at least like three to five videos a week. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, I'd say if I was to give you like a time percentage, like of how I break things up, it's still generally if, if I include like research into the crypto space into my YouTube time, because that's where I, you know, how I talk about things in the market. And it also plays into Digifox and knowing the market trends. Um, I would say it's a 50 50 split still. Um, you know, I'm starting to merge more and more time to be fair towards Digifox because you know, as a CEO of the company and seeing it grow and stuff, I have to be more active and, you know, we're planning to, to scale out the company and continue adding to the team. So stuff like that has been occupying my time uh, probably more than it's swallowing my time more than anything. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm interested to hear what you got planned, Quentin and stuff. But I think it's so cool. Like we, I think for many of us who have been in the space, we're like either building our own stuff or like just kind of finding ways where we can contribute as well outside of producing content, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, definitely. It's it's one way to contribute, but it's always fun to do some other stuff. And I think like for 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 the people who who have like a YouTube channel, um, there is some kind of entrepreneurship in these people from the beginning already. Otherwise, you wouldn't have started with a YouTube channel and kept going and 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 came this far. So I think a lot of people that are now like the the bigger YouTubers and the mid-sized YouTubers, which which I'm personally in, I think. Um, they, they, they are doing other stuff as well now. And I, 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 I really love to see it that everyone is like contributing in his or her own way. Um, yeah, that's, it's really cool, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. I think it's so cool. Like, I mean, for me, it was like very difficult. Like during the bear market, it seemed like nothing was going on. I remember back when I visited in Utrecht, it was back in April, finally, when we got this big move in Bitcoin and everyone got really excited. But like this this whole time I was like, man, I'm, I'm trying to find people who want to build and stuff and do things. And I, I came to find that a lot of people were working on stuff. And it, it tends to be that while things are quiet, the smart builders will build. And then it comes to time when the market is ready and then they release it and they get it out there. So, yeah, I'm very excited. I think we're, you know, people are deploying things right now. It's the time for it. The time to be working on things has been for the last year or so. And uh, people who've been, you know, silently working on things and bringing out things that are going to fit into the DeFi narrative and everything that everyone's looking forward to and earning yields and, you know, being able to do swaps, things that sort of, it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, but, definitely. Yeah. I, I think DeFi as a whole is just fascinating as a topic because, um, uh, you know, it's, it's grown so much from like back in 2017 before there was even a label. I remember following Kyber Network and in 2018 following Compound and Celsius. And now we're getting to this point where there's like crazy waves of new projects coming out every single week. Definitely. I, I, I just tweeted it like a few hours ago, even on Twitter. It's so hard to keep up with all the new DeFi uh, yeah, projects yeah. and all the yield farming projects in particular. Uh, wow, man, it's 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 so insane. That alone is already a, a full time job, I think, to research everything. So uh, but yeah, like you mentioned, um, so many people have been building throughout the bear market um, and I think people like you and me, we, we mentioned DeFi several times, we were excited about it, but there was not a lot of things going on. The, the total value locked back then was like, I think one year ago it was 
maybe like 200 million or something. And now we passed like 10 billion total value locked in, in, in DeFi project. That's insane. The growth is, it's mind blowing. And, and like I said, you, if you look at the graph on DeFi Pulse, for example, you see like from, from compound uh, onwards, you see this this graph totally exploding <laughs> upwards. Uh, so since that time, it's only a few months. It went from, if I'm not wrong, like 400 million to right now 10 billion. Insane, yeah. insane. It's it's actually the only thing that the market cares about right now. It's even weird. Yeah, I mean, again, I think you see that dynamic where like even the exchanges, even CZ came out yeah. with all due respect to him and stuff. But he he brought like a very he was is just bluntly honest and said. We are only listing things like sushi swap and why they cannot all these stay tokens. behind they can't stay behind yeah. exactly and it, it's so amazing because so many of these exchanges for years not saying uh binance was one of the few i guess they did their decks early on but like a lot of crypto exchanges said that this was not going to happen there's so many kind of people who said DeFi, it's a fairy tale and stuff like you're never going to have an intermediary removed from the party and on transactions like that but now we're seeing it as you mentioned quentin where we kind of had this nice initial growth of DeFi, where, as you mentioned, it was a few hundred million for the most part in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then we capped out at like a billion. And I was like, oh, this is like the catalyst moment. And I was wrong. It, it turned out that it went to a billion and then it kind of went down to like, you know, a few hundred million, mm -hmm. I think, with the March dip. And then after that, we had the compound event. And that was the match that just that set off the yeah. S curve. Yeah. So I'm very, very excited to see DeFi keep growing. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, whether we have pullbacks in the market or not, what you found is when Bitcoin was pulling back like, you know, 15, 20%, at the same time, you could still see the total value of the market going up in US dollar terms. And if you look, you can see the ETH numbers are still growing. The Bitcoin, rap Bitcoin is accelerating at a rapid pace. As Definitely. I know you'd mentioned, and I've been watching this well. It's like, it's crazy. So I think just um, being able to have that ability to break down what's going on in DeFi right now is, is very, very valuable. And to see that kind of trend formulating early on because this is just the beginning. I totally agree. Um, for example, you, you also mentioned like the, the DEXs, so the decentralized exchanges. To be honest, I was one of the people who really thought like this was going to be nothing, but I had in my mind, like you had um, Binance DEX, you had some other decentralized exchanges like um, EtherDelta, for example, and mm -hmm. they were so user unfriendly. This was so hard for many people to use that I thought like, yeah, this is not going to be anything. And then you suddenly had, um, had Uniswap. And, and when Uniswap started taking off and I started using it, I thought like, wow, this is, this is insane. Um, this is just so easy. I mean, like people can just put their, uh, put their coins on a ledger on their ERC20 wallet and, and just like use it. And it, it never needs to, to leave the wallet actually. I mean, like there's not like other steps like sending from the ledger to Binance and then from Binance back. Like it's so great. I mean, that really opened my eyes. And since that time, I'm, I'm also becoming, a, became like a little, um, and a big fan actually of, uh, of, of these protocols, of these, uh, these projects, these DEXs. Um, and of course, like Uniswap right now, and it's getting forked constantly right now. We have the, the sushi saga in the last few weeks, um, but it's also nice. I mean, like you see the migration of the of the of the liquidity from uh, Uniswap to sushi, and right now from that point, people just start um, forking it even more. And you, right now, in the last few days, you saw several Uniswap forks popping up, hoping to get like liquidity and stuff. It's insane. It's insane. But indeed, like you mentioned, the DEXs are something that I really underestimated a year ago, even though I was like a big fan of DeFi already. Yeah, no, no, to build on that, Quentin, I think back maybe in 2017, I was a bit skeptical, like outside of players at like Kyber Network and stuff that utilize smart contracts. There was, there was no like really clear vision of like how a DEX would operate. And the, the biggest problem above all, like even if you could see the, the ability, I could see the value in this case of removing the middleman. That makes total sense. And being mm -hmm. able to have like autonomous, um, permissionless swapping of whatever asset you want, that's huge. Um, the the thing that I always struggled to see was like, man, how are you really going to incentivize like pulling substantial liquidity? And like, I think that was the problem that many, many, uh, many people building DEXs are very tech minded and they never really thought about like, what are the market dynamics of what we need to bring in before people are actually going to feel an incentive to use our system? So, I mean, Uniswap doesn't charge much fees. It charges the 0.3%, but that 0.3% on total trade volume is to provide for the liquidity providers. And that was the perfect cue to get people to start putting in money. And then you had 
you know, this speculative token like Sushi Swap mm -hmm. or some kind of second layer um, reward system that just made it go exponential. So yeah, I think what I think what Sushi Swap proved, I really don't know if Sushi Swap will be around long term in the sense of like enough incentive to bring in trillions of dollars of liquidity. Mm -hmm. But what it, I think it showed us was that we are so close to having like the perfect incentive structure. I think we're probably a month or two away from finding something new that's going to pop up in DeFi where we are going to get that vertical rally again and Uniswap or another copycat like Sushi Swap is just going to go vertical. And it's the in the sense of liquidity, in the sense of volume. And it's going to be a real challenge to a lot of traditional exchanges. And I think that, I mean, you can see Binance and a lot of these players like Coinbase as well. But the fact that they're listing these tokens so quickly. They're trying so hard. Mm. Yeah, I agree, man. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's it's a it's a telltale sign that like if people are still doubting this trend right now, it's gonna be very clear two or three months out. I mean, it's it's speculative, but it's crazy right now. Some of this will be very short term, but excluding some of the yield farming at, and the crazy levels that it's at right now, I think DeFi is very much here to stay. If you if you understand a lot of the core projects that have been around for a while, definitely. And what's also very remarkable is that it's 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 like all built on Ethereum. Um, do you think Ethereum has won by this point? That's an interesting question, man. I, like I, the blockchain race? <laughs> you know, I, I've had this debate in my mind for a while, man. I know that there's a lot of blockchains who are building for DeFi. I know NEO just launched, Flam or they're working on launching Flamingo, which is like their all-in-one decentralized finance platform. Um, there's EOS has had some DeFi services, and then also Polkadot is probably the biggest rival that everyone's really yeah, excited thanks. about. Yeah, I think so too. I think that, you know, there's a chance, but the, the only, here's the thing, like at the end of the day, ETH's tech is not the best in the world. Um, there's, there's tons of other blockchains that maybe have more scalability or maybe even better security or something like that, whatever. I think that the, the two things that Ethereum does very well is that it has a great network effect of developers and developers are what lead to great apps being built. Um, and then also that not just being built, but also having more apps in your ecosystem allows your app to pull from those applications. So um, not just forking, but also connecting and interbuilding off of one another. So you're in finance is basically that, uh, I mean, outside of a few additions. But um, outside of that as well, um, I think the other thing that the Ethereum has behind it in this is the sense of liquidity. It's the second largest cryptocurrency that has a programmable framework on it all of these tokens and the stable coins that are built on them are built on Ethereum. Um, I think that that alone gives Ethereum such a big advantage because um, I know that Tether recently moved some stable coins to EOS, for example. I think they did like 100 million or some kind of large amount that they're moving over. If EOS can do that and it gets enough liquidity, then, then maybe people will start to opt in to use EOS. But the liquidity is what matters. It's the reason why people, you know, it makes sense for me or someone else to use Uniswap now. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. On, on the other hand, you've, you mentioned a few hundred million, but at the same time, Tether moved over like one billion from billion. from Tron to to Ethereum. Ethereum to, today, just today, and that was like yeah. one of many different withdrawals they've done. Which yeah. Is like, I mean. Yeah. But like you said, like it's it's like it became one big ecosystem. Everything is connected to each other right now from DeFi, um, like especially the yield farming stuff. I mean, you you put like your Ethereum in in this this platform, you get like um, YETH for example, and then you get like you put it in another platform and then another platform. I mean, you don't have that for other blockchains, right? You don't have this for for EOS. You don't have this for Polkadot yet even though I agree with you that this is likely the biggest competitor. But I mean, you see, you see everything is being built on Ethereum uh, with a few exceptions and everything is getting so connected to each other that I think it will be hard to like uh, compete with this entire ecosystem. So yeah, I think honestly, I, I think I'm more and more getting, I'm getting more and more convinced that, that Ethereum has won by now. So yeah. I, I agree with you. I think that at least for right now, like, I mean, I have no doubt there's probably going to be, if there is something that comes up, there's somebody who's going to be screaming to the roof. Ah, see, I was doing my research and I called this out, but it, I think it's a little shooting in the dark. I mean, I, I've like, I, as you probably know, Quentin, like I've done investing even before crypto, like in traditional stocks and like emerging industries, you know, it's easy to spot general waves of like, of industries that are going to come up. So crypto would be an example of that as a whole market. And maybe DeFi is more of a good example within the crypto industry. Yeah. But the problem is, is spawning like new competition to come in. And it's so difficult. Like you could have probably found a dozen companies that might have been rivals to Apple. Um, you know, but at the same time, some people, for example, I could say back in 2006 and seven, BlackBerry was the major smartphone. 
And then Apple came up out of nowhere and said, uh, people were like, no, Apple can't do this. No one's going to want to touch their screen and stuff. <laughs> and then basically it becomes the new standard. So there, there is a chance where things can start to cycle and change very dramatically. But you need a seismic shift where you can draw the developers and the network effect of users over there. And uh, quite frankly, you know, again, I, I always try to open up to different blockchains, but I don't see that kind of parabolic growth in the sense of unique wallet addresses, uh, the growth in actual DeFi applications. And that's where, again, I, I might have an investment in some of these things, but I don't put my bias when I'm talking about the reality and the fundamentals. Ethereum's got it. And, yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I'll, I'm also invested in a few other ones um, like you, but it's more like a hatch, you know, like in, just in case that, it, that that something will take over Ethereum, that you're at least in it, you know. So, exactly. um yeah, I, I don't think that's a, that's a bad thing. It's just hatching in in in, in case of like taking over Ethereum, but um, but yeah, for me personally, also Ethereum is like my second biggest altcoin, um, and I've been accumulating Ethereum very hard over over the last uh, several months. So yeah, we'll see. It's interesting, but don't you think like this 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 yield farming thing and and DeFi? Don't you think it's going too hard at this point? Mm. I think it's a good point, Quentin. So when it comes to yield farming, yes, I do agree. Um, and the reason why is because uh, there is no way in the world, like crypto interest rates through compound and Celsius are already pretty high, like through like the centralized lending pools and the decentralized lending pools, you can already get a great yield compared to your bank. Um, and these are already, and these are lending out to a market that happens to have a very high borrowing demand, which leads to very high interest rates for depositors. Um, but so that alone is already unique enough compared to traditional finance where the average savings account in the US is 0.06% right now. So six one hundredths <laughs> of a percentage point, if you can think about it, practically it's, nothing. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. so sad. I mean, like many people earn that in one minute by yield farming. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, so and that's the, that's the thing about yield farming where you have these crazy opportunities where some websites or some um, dApps, I would say in this case, are offering the ability to supposedly earn like a thousand percent APY or a few hundred percent APY. I know the biggest one that most people know about is like urine finance. So you have mm -hmm. the vaults where you can deposit your ETH um, and you can put your ETH in and by the end of the year, you might get 80, 90 percent more ETH, which sounds great. Double your ETH in that case. But there's a very, I think there's a very big problem with a lot of this. The reason why uh, the yields on some of these are very high is either they do one of two things. They either are um, they're, they're all variable, that's important to keep in mind, so they can change over time. But some of them are due to the rate of people staking in this case and withdrawing. But the biggest one in this case that I think is a big problem with urine finance and other protocols that provide a high, relatively kind of reasonable but high yields, like the 80, 90% on ETH, is how these vaults actually work. So the way that urine finance, uh, the vault for uh, why ETH in this case works is that you have a Ethereum that you deposit into a maker contract and you're able to get DAI in this case, which then you go and basically use uh, to farm certain types of cryptos. In this case, it's been Curve Finance. Um, and that sounds great on paper. You're getting the, uh, the Curve tokens and then you sell them for more ETH and then you generate ETH. Um, but the problem is with that, that a lot of people aren't asking about is the collateral risk there, which is where you're locking up your Ether and Maker DAO. So if ETH's price goes down 50%, you lose all your core ETH. You might have made some interest in ETH during that time period, but you're going to lose all your core ETH. And the problem with this is that we were very close just a couple of weeks ago when ETH was going from the upper four hundred dollar range. Yeah, down to nearly like, five hundred in ETH. To yeah, like, ex it was almost a fifty percent correction. Yeah. And if that would have happened, Quentin, it would have been just like back in March where there was almost a mass uh, margin call event where ETH's price would just keep dumping and dumping because as the uh, um, margin call event happens on the maker contract, they have to sell those ETH. And it's a negative compounding event where you would have had all these people who are over leveraged and over collateralized, even just, it's just 2x leverage basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but still True. it would be too much at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And I think like a lot of people don't know about the risks, um, but then you have like other projects and you, you sometimes see like projects popping up and after a few hours, there are like millions of dollars thrown into it. Um, and like, um, yeah, an audited project, we saw it for Jam, for example, we saw it happening for Jam and there was like a bug in the contract and, and suddenly this, this token dumped, like, I don't know how much it was, like 99% in just a few minutes. I mean, there is so much risk and everyone is taking, in my opinion, too much risks right now. So it, it really feels 
like a bubbly, you know? It fe yeah. really feels like a bubble and, and people are just throwing money to everything. And, and really, if something is going to, going to get a rock, like bad like you mentioned for example for 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 urine finance like a 50 percent uh price uh, dump of eth would make like so many people get liquidated um on the maker contract so people really need to calm down a little bit i think and and everything feels like going too hard and yeah of course everyone wants to be like in the very beginning of a project to farm the governance token because the apy is then like thousands of percentage points and if like a lot of tvl is there like a lot of value went to the project then then of course the the, the apy is like maybe like a few hundred percents mm. only you know um yeah. that i think that's the main reason why people want to get into these projects immediately after they get launched and they don't care if it's unaudited but it's so risky it's yeah, crazy. I would say this, Quentin, like, you know, whether it's, uh, let's say, let's do a hypothetical situation. So I'm a commercial bank, right? Let's say, for example, and I, I, I offer to you personally, I'm like, hey, Quentin, we have a way where you can deposit any amount of money and we'll give you 10% APY today. But any time over the next month, within 30 days, I'm going to collapse as a business. It could be tomorrow. It could be 30 days from now. Would you ever, if you could even get 10, 20 percent, like no, 20, 10 or 20 percent daily interest, mm -hmm. would you take that as a person? And I personally know, I know most people probably wouldn't in this case. Uh, maybe if you're looking to gamble, maybe that's fine. But that's basically the point there where all these systems are gambling. They're unaudited contracts. They're forks of unaudited contracts. They're, you know, not even taking the time to actually get proper code auditing review. And the, the thing for me personally with like what we do with Digifox is I know from the get go, like we're not going to be putting in any kind of like crazy out there yield farming applications because of that reason. We want to make sure that, you know, when someone puts their money into something, I mean, if they want to go do that, they can do that on MetaMask and they can go kind of speculate and stuff. But for me personally, I don't think that that's the substantial thing that defines DeFi. I don't think that's decentralized finance. It's putting it into a, a casino. Yeah, true. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. And you want like, you mentioned Digifox, for example, you want people to put their money in sustainable things like Celsius Network, for example. This is sustainable. There is like uh, one way you put in the money and the money is doing something. I mean, it's not going towards other platforms that are like shady and stuff. No, they're like they are giving loans with that money and yeah. that's what you get your, your yield from. So that's yeah, yeah. An, a totally other situation. But I mean, you, you, you can see that people they, they, they really want to gamble nowadays. There's not a lot of total value locked in, in, in these projects going up, you know? Like it's, it's, it's considerably higher in these uh, risky projects. Maybe it's like the nature of crypto, I don't know, than like in these legit sustainable projects. Like the total value there is just not going up so hard. Uh, it's yeah. very weird. It, it, to build on that, Quentin, like it's like the simpler and the, the more stupid and simple you can keep it, the better. So like if your project has a vegetable in its name <laughs> or like if you if you have unaudited code, it's like like when we used to like review white papers as YouTubers. Now the, the goal is like you have to see, oh, is there a vegetable in the name? Good. Let's, let's buy it. <laughs> like is there wait, you're telling me it's unaudited code and it's on mainnet. We got to do it. No test net. No, no, no. We can't wait for it. We got to get in this now. Like. And it's like definitely everything. It's like all logic has been broken. And this kind of plays, I think, you know, into the macro th topics that we talk about, like in equity markets, things don't make sense. Like hedge funds, I think because of this new wave of retail investors we've had in all markets, but also with Fed liquidity, the way that it is, everything's going up. And the things that are going up are what retail investors are buying. So now you have this wave where institutions are piggybacking off of the retail investors and bringing in the institutional liquidity and propping up these companies that retail mm -hmm. investors are buying, which is like really interesting. It's it's a dynamic that I don't think we, we've seen since the dot-com bubble, if anything. Definitely. That's also something I really wanted to talk about with you because you are, I think you are more into like the traditional markets than I am. Um, but what I see happening is also not good in traditional markets. Um, let's just take the most famous example, Tesla. Um, What's happening there? I, I I really don't understand it. I mean, it's currently at a one thousand price earning ratio. I mean, why? What, how is this possible? I mean, there's this is there's a certain gap. If you just look at it yeah. objectively, I mean, there's a certain gap at how much cars they can and will produce, and there will still be competition. And if you then look to the value of Tesla compared to all of these big competitors combined. 
it's also mind blowing. I mean, all these competitors are, are like making many more cars than, than Tesla, but Tesla is like a tech stock maybe as well. Um, and everyone's just throwing money at it. I mean, it's at 1000 price earnings right, right now. That's ridiculous, right? Yeah. So uh, to, to point two things before I go on my rant about Tesla, <laughs> I like I do I think Quentin maybe you're in the same but I like Tesla as a company. Definitely. They, they do, yeah, they do cool things, right? And also Definitely. we have to be fair that there will always just like crypto, there's always going to be speculation. Really, a stock's price is determined by what someone's willing to pay for it at the end of the day. But you bring up a very good point, Quinn, and this is like the thing that I try to ex I, I try to portray to people like what's going on right now. So we have two interesting phenomena that happened. So with when COVID happened and the lockdown happened, and we had the greatest depression since the, the 1920s, sorry, the 1930s, you know, the worst one in over a century, right? So now we're at this point where we have, you know, equity values dropping like a rock. People know why it's dropping like a rock. Everyday people get it because everything's shut down. They're inside. They, they've gotten, they've been given a paycheck um, from the government and they're realizing, wait a minute, like everything's down right now. Stocks are at a major discount. I missed out on a lot of this bull rally. And I know things are going to open back up. So what they start doing is they pick the things that they know got hit the worst, the airline stocks, the uh, cruise stocks. This was the first phenomenon we saw where they were buying things that they knew were cheap. And the hedge funds and even the big investors like Warren Buffett were selling at this time. And they, they even know, they knew the environment of monetary policy. They knew the central banks were going to print, but they didn't buy the trade. They, they actually, in, in fact, Warren Buffett was on the opposite. And he sold mm -hmm. a major loss in his airlines. So what you saw for the first and time- And his bank stocks, by the way. His, exactly, his bank <laughs> stocks, exactly, yeah. And that, that those two points there were like, well, wait a minute, like, the retail investor over the next few months going into like May and June won against all hedge funds, like the broad retail base of users uh, or the basically the darts, like these are like the kind of everyday mom and pop investors or kind of young investors, millennials, who are basically investing in these stocks. And it started to change the dynamic where it used to be that the hedge funds and the institutionals with all their capital drove the market, but there was so much retail liquidity where it was driving up all these tech companies and now the hedge funds have to follow them. So what you're seeing now with Tesla is they know that Tesla is the hottest stock for investors. Everyone loves Tesla in the United States and even abroad. So what you have is the initial retail wave that brought Tesla's value up and started to cause basically a short selling event, um, or sorry, a short squeeze on all the people who are betting against mm -hmm. the stock. There's no short interest on Tesla now. And because there's no short interest now, the retail investors are propping up and the hedge funds want to get on the action. They have to follow the retail investor. And then it's just accelerating and accelerating and then you have monetary policy. And now Tesla is the most valuable automobile company in the world. And then you have the narrative as well with Tesla. The last thing you need to think about is that Tesla is more than just an automobile company. It's got, you know, it's got solar uh, that it's dealing. So it's a power company to a degree, the battery technology. And this is where you just kind of reach this, the sky is the limit mindset where yeah, Tesla definitely. could be a, a $5 trillion company. Yeah, it's it's all ridiculous, of course. And it's it's gonna be very short lived yeah. in the long run. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, like, like you mentioned, it's not only the cars that they produce. I mean, like the batteries right now and the solar that they are in, um, it's also th something, but I mean, nothing will uh, justify like a 1000 PA, nothing. It's like exactly. pure speculation. And especially if you think at the current times we are in, I mean, like it's still, the economies are doing bad. It's still like a pandemic and you see these valuations, then you think like, how is this possible? I don't know what like the, 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 the average values were in the dot-com bubble, but I think 1000 PE, that's it's not something I didn't see in like since I started on, on in stocks and that's like nine years ago. I never saw it, um, mm. especially not on this in this scale for such a big company. Um, so, for example, also if you look at Amazon, Amazon is like the third or fourth biggest uh, company in the world with a market cap of 1.5 nearly trillion, um, and it's at a PE of 120. I mean, it's already 1.5 trillion dollars market cap it's like the one of the biggest in the world and still this gets like a valuation of 120 or 130 price earnings i mean it's insane i don't know what what people are thinking currently yeah. so, so there's actually there's two interesting dynamics i've built on that coin you're, you're very right um the the first thing is that these valuations are so high right now so if you want amazon uh, uh, let's say i think i know apple's at a two trillion dollar valuation or at least it mm -hmm. was a week ago so if you want Apple to double as a company, if you want to make a 100% return, it's going to have to go to $4 trillion in market cap. 
And then after that, it's going to have to go to $8 trillion. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to go to $16 trillion. Like if you want to keep doing that double uh, at these big valuation intervals. And that alone is getting into absolutely parabolic, unreasonable territory. Um, but the second point that's important to keep in mind is to know where we are in the market right now. I don't know if you saw this, Quentin. Did you see like how Apple and Tesla and so many major tech companies, these companies that have gone parabolic for some odd reason, are now starting to do stock splits, interestingly enough, so that the share price is a bit cheaper to buy. So what does that tell you in this case? Who are they trying to get to buy the stock yeah, now? The, yeah, of course, it's like the retail. The little guy. Yeah, the exactly. retail investor like, oh, it was like the Tesla stock was $1,500. Right now, it's like only $200. I need now this. Now I can buy yeah. it. Like, yeah. I can and buy it's, a, full, a full share. Of it, yeah, it's you know, man, it's funny because, like, I can, I, I, we, I guess, we can laugh about it because it's so yeah. obvious if you if you understand how it works and stuff because it's, it's it's humans, it's psychology, but like, yeah, definitely. The really sad thing is that you can see the the day after, this is the day or the day after in this case, or like maybe the next trading week after Tesla and Apple did their stock split, share values just basically dropped like a rock. And mm -hmm. this is basically them offloading uh, institutions or hedge funds who have been holding these positions, riding that retail wave, selling onto the order book, massive market sell orders in this case. And Tesla, I can't remember the exact price, but it dropped like, I mean, a substantial amount like of, of its gains from the past month where it was just going vertical. And that's the institutions cashing out. I know the average retail investor hasn't sold. And sadly, a lot of them, just like in crypto, who buy Bitcoin at 18 or 20K, they're going to get caught holding a bag. And unlike crypto, which was a early market and will come back to that point, mm -hmm. I don't think Tesla will ever reach these kind of valuations until no. a very long period of time. Similar, as you mentioned, Quentin, the similarities to the dot-com bubble. It took 20 or almost 20 years in this case, 18 years to get back up to the previous highs of the dot-com bubble. For a few these, companies. Uh, if for a few companies, yeah. you're exactly right. That's another point that's important that, you know, we have not seen this kind of valuation growth at the scale that some of these companies are in market cap. I mean, it is unheard of. And to say that it's sustainable to any degree, I mean, like, it's like yield farming. It's going to come yeah. and go very, very quickly, or at least the crazy side of yield mm -hmm. farming. Yeah, I can only agree to that. I mean, um, you even see like like you mentioned Warren Buffett, he sold his um, his bank stocks as well and he went into gold um, and his airline stocks. Of course, he didn't buy gold, but it, it tells you something. I mean, even though it's only his uh, lieutenants um, who, who probably like said like, yeah, we, we want to buy some, some, some gold mining um, companies. Uh, it's probably that, but it's also telling, you know, uh, Warren Buffett is not going to allow this in good economic times. And if, if he doesn't know, like, or doesn't feel that there's something coming, you know, he probably he, he hates gold, but like gold mining companies still produce um, money. They they have revenue and that's probably good for him. He's, he probably thinks like, yeah, many people will, will go to gold very soon. That's why we need these gold mining stocks right now. So. I think this is one of the most telling things that happened in the past few months that that even he thinks that this is not not good anymore. Yeah, uh, it's interesting, Quinn, you're the first person I've seen like as a content creator mention the fact that he bought a gold mining company versus actual gold. Yeah. That was a, uh, but but no, but nonetheless, it does say something still like I think to your point, I think it says that it was a happy medium for someone like Warren because he will never own a non like performing asset. He would never own like a Bitcoin mm -hmm. or gold itself as a commodity because he thinks it's nothing more than a shiny rock and it doesn't produce anything. It's not like a farm or an asset of some mm -hmm. sort that has dividends or yield. So yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think that, you know, above all this is a telltale sign that, you know, we've got a lot of excitement coming into the hard assets and the crypto space and gold as well. Um, over the next few months, it, once we break above my, my kind of thing that I've told to people on my channel is whatever it is, whether it's the end of this year, quarter one of 2021, maybe even more long term than that. Whenever we get above 20K, when we get above the previous all time highs, that's when things go crazy. I mean, it, if you think DeFi right now is crazy, if the altcoin market is crazy, <laughs> like if Chainlink and the oracles are, are going crazy and stuff just wait until we go beyond 20k on bitcoin because that is when institutions um start to take the asset class serious again they realize okay that wasn't just a bubble that was a part of the broader cycles of this at this asset and for me i can speak to that as well i got interested again in bitcoin 
when I saw a post that showed Bitcoin going back to its all time highs in 2016, I heard about it in 2011. I rubbed it off. I said, ah, oh, it's like I brushed it off and said, this is a silly ass. It's never going to take off. And then we had that event happen and I knew I had to understand what it was. And once I read the white paper, I got it and the market fundamentals were there and it got me into crypto. So I think it's going to be the same for institutions at 20K. I'm curious, Gordon, what do you think? Like, what's going to be that kind of like make or break moment in that case for crypto? Yeah, I think like many people, too many people are looking at 20K level. So I think that something else will happen, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably going to be some reverse psychology thing that uh, ah. it's, yeah I, I think so because you know you're not the only one uh, you know that that is watching like the 20k level uh, it happened like the previous cycles that's true that once it broke its all-time high that it went parabolic um, and that was of course the the big like uh, parabolic year the bull year um, but I, I cannot estimate it right now what is going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be like uh, the 20K level that is going to be the big trigger. So I think it's going to be something else, but I cannot point out what yet, you know? So maybe it's going to go through like 16K and not stop and and and, and don't, don't, don't have a correction at 20K because I think a lot of people think like 20K will be like the last point at which we will see a correction and go through it. It's, it's hard to say what the trigger will be um but yeah we'll see yeah man it's gonna be interesting i think as you mentioned there it won't be like just the price going through there has to be some kind of visual catalyst with it that kind of propels this like the story or the narrative with it that actually leads prices higher i think the first time we make it to, like near 20k we're gonna get rejected we did that last time yeah we did it last time we, indeed. yeah it basically pulls back a bit and then we do like a kind of um uh, almost kind of like a cup and handle in a sense where we go from the previous high back to the all-time highs we pull back down and then we go vertical in that case. But um, yeah, man, I don't know. I, I, it's it's so hard to predict. Crypto is so crazy. Like if you would have told me we'd be farming vegetable tokens uh, <laughs> a month ago, I would have been like, yeah, that's so silly. Like, Or that there's a, a, a bigger competitor to Uniswap. I would have said that's crazy. And yeah, here we are. It, it, it goes so fast. It's, it's hard to keep up with it. Uh, but yeah, like you mentioned, that I think that that's something something will happen for crypto and I think we will see a similar like end of the cycle the last year um, but yeah the, the, the I don't know like, like you mentioned the, the the external catalyst the external trigger maybe this is going to be something um, that will like catapult the price um, upwards but yeah I like I said the 20k I think it's like a, an overcrowded trade that a lot of people will watch like 20k then correction and then go through it so maybe it's just going to it's going to be something completely different it'll completely just go straight through different, or yeah. like yeah <laughs> you, you never That's know That's a good point yeah what do you think about like like silver and gold you think like um they will play a big role in the coming years you said like the next few months but like the coming years you think they they will go hand in hand with bitcoin or what will be the correlation you think mm. I don't think that they're going to have the same multiples like they had in the last cycle because you're dealing with a higher base price like from the bottom. Uh, but needless to say, I think we'll, on silver, we'll blow past the previous all-time highs and same with gold. And the only reason for that is that if you consider not only just the market price, like it tends to be that with market cycles, you go to new all-time highs and you set higher lows. But outside of that, there's two dynamics at play. You have inflation that needs to be accounted for. But if we just look at the CPI or the consumer price index for inflation, it's very misleading. Um, if you look at things like shadow stats, um, which is a little bit over exacerbated on what real inflation is, or if you look at um, there's there's another one called the Chapwood Index, which measures that average everyday life uh, per year is increasing at an inflation rate of around six to ten percent in in different cities in the U.S. So think about that for a second. Yeah, six percent. Yeah. So I think that um, considering that uh, that's at play, the inflation rates are much higher. We're going to finally, with the central bank printing um, and also the last few years of central bank liquidity that was already created in the early 2010s, and in this case, we're going to really see gold start to go up. I don't think as much as Bitcoin, though. I, that's why I always tell people, you know, I think that gold could have a multi 100% rally in this next run up. It could go up 100%, 200%, but I really don't see gold at the scale of the market it's at. It's a, I think right now it's around a $12, 13000000000000 trillion market. Mm -hmm. It's hard for that to double to go to 26 to justify it going to 26 trillion whereas bitcoin right now is sitting at i think it's like a little under 200 billion i mean to go to 400 billion is nothing um especially with the liquidity that got us to this point so mm -hmm. i think yeah 
Yeah, I mean, like the last the last um, cycle, there was not a lot of smart money pouring in because there were not a lot of options to do so. So I think mainly, of course, it was like a, a, a portion of that was, of course, institutional money. But um, I think the majority of the money that that brought us to 20k and evaluation of, I think back then it was also going to be like 35 uh, to 350, sorry, mm-hmm. so like two, 350 billion dollars. Um, I think this was mainly retail money as well so of course a lot of people are anticipating on that but i think it's with good reason we see like many platforms um offering this we see grayscale buying a lot for their uh institutional investors um i mean these things are finally there in place so that institutional money don't need to hold their bitcoins themselves and i think that's very important this will open the gates to like the big money and like you mentioned by that time um, that we are at, at at 20k again. This is going to be like um, around 400 um, by that time, then 400 billion dollars. I think even from that point, doubling is going to be very easy with like the new liquidity that we have uh, from uh, from institutional money and and maybe even more. I mean, like one one trillion is definitely in place uh, in place. Sorry, um, even a few trillions. I think mm-hmm. so. I really think so. Yeah. Yeah, so if you think if you do the math and stuff with the total value, like even the total supply of Bitcoin, the ones that even haven't been mined yet, and also not factoring that some have been lost, if you took the twenty-one million coins and you have a hundred thousand dollar price, you basically have a two point one trillion dollar valuation, which is incredibly reasonable. I mean, that's not even touching where gold markets are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that's where people start saying, "What about two hundred k?" And in that case, you have four point two trillion. Still very reasonable um, and still at a much lower multiple than where it was in the previous cycle uh, from going down from $200 to 20000 So, you know, I think that those that's a reasonable price range. But the, the thing I always tell people is that, and I'm curious to get your take on it, Quentin, like my time horizon for this cycle is going into late 2022, if not into 2023. Um, I'm not quite certain we'll just be able to have it all in 2021 because I think the big holdback is, as we've already seen with this cycle, is that we haven't gotten to the all-time highs yet. And until we kind of get towards that range where there's no, like it's kind of the sky's the limit, we still haven't reached to, um, you know, there's no points of resistance. I think we're gonna kind of slowly and steadily move up in this case over the next few months or so. What's your take on that? I'm curious to hear your take. Yeah, I, I, I think something something similar, but for me, like the time frame is still between the end of 2021 and the end of 2022. So I always take the average and I say like the half of 2022 that we will see like a new all time high for uh, for the market. Um, oh no, sorry, sorry, not for the all time high, just like the uh, like the fun, uh, yeah, that- yeah, the top of the, uh, the top of the cycle. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, not all time high. Um, yeah. I was wrong, sorry. Um, no, 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 so worries. so yeah, I think that that is my time frame, but um, that's that. I think it's very hard to predict at this point because you you see like previous previous cycles they were getting longer and longer and this will likely happen again. Um, so that's why I think like rather maybe the end of 2022, but not a lot. I don't think it will be a lot later because if you have if you have a look to where we are right now in in the cycle compared to the same year of previous cycle, it's still very similar. So that would mean that we will we would still need to range for an extra year and that would be weird to me you know that's why why i say like the end of 2021 it's already possible but some something between that but i think we will we will get like a lot more uh information on that once we hit the previous all-time high of 20k Mm -hmm. then we can really compare it to when did this happen this cycle and when did this happen last cycle so then you have maybe have like yeah from this point one year maybe you can say something like that so uh i think that will be very important to to like first touch the previous all-time high before uh we can really say like then the cycle is going to end uh but yeah of course it's 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 like based on on, on history you never know because it's you don't know it. It's it's you can only base it on, on on some data you have from history from previous cycles, but it's still like guessing, right? Absolutely, man. I think that's the the overarching kind of sentiment is that the more macro events like in the cycle that you have, so you mentioned revisiting the all time high. Like if we can see we outpaced that growth mm-hmm. from the bottom of the cycle. Um, from the bear market to the new cycle high and stuff. How long did that take? You can start to get much more data to see like, okay, are we moving faster this time? Yeah. Or are we kind of like taking longer for the cycle? So yeah. I agree with you. I think 
all in all, man, I think the cool thing is, it's like, we're kind of, we're comfy. We're, we're in the definitely. market We're yeah, we're definitely just kind of watching it happen and stuff. And I think the cool thing is, is that while we're waiting for this cycle to go, we're building and we're, we're playing a role into it. So I'm, I'm real eager to, man, I, I, I just to let everyone know, Quinn has not told me what he's working on. So I'm, I'm interested to hear <laughs> what he's working on behind the scenes. Yeah, that will come soon. will come soon. But anyway, uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about is like the, the, the presidential election. Do you think that this will have an impact this time? Because we saw like the election of Trump last year. Um, I think many people thought like the price would dump if Trump would be elected, but he, he got elected and actually the markets moved up. And I think many, not many people expected this. And right now you see like the reverse thing, maybe like everyone is anticipating that um, if Trump wins again, that the market is going, going up again for some weird reason. At least that's what, that's what I see like on social media. Um, but do you think this will have an impact? Like who, who's becoming the president? I, I think Bitcoin is so, I mean, outside of just adding maybe volatility from the event, I don't think it, the a presidential election will have too much of a decision on on where the asset goes. It does on stocks for sure because what you saw the night of the election back in 2016 um, was that when when I think when Trump had won Florida, you could wa I was watching the futures market live. They were dumping, and everyone thought like, wait, like isn't Trump going to be good for stocks because he has the tax cuts and stuff <laughs> like that? But what was happening? It started to form this kind of bottom here where you started to see stocks up and then they shot up because what was happening was people were closing out of the stocks they thought would do well if uh, Hillary won back in the previous election. And then they started going into the stocks that were going to do well under Trump. So U.S. Steel popped up the next morning. The overall market popped up the day after that Trump was elected in, on, on November 7th. Um, on November 8th was the actual day of the market, sorry. But uh, basically, yeah, everything had basically moved up still after that. But the major movers were the U.S. Steel, the kind of industrial companies that were going to benefit from the new infrastructure. Yeah, he promised stuff. like the, opening the mines again and doing like yeah. industrial things, getting that back to, to the U.S., yeah. Exactly. So that's mm -hmm. the stuff that like it affected stock markets, no doubt about that. Um, and the biggest thing that everyone was so happy about was, wait, like this means corporate tax cuts and this means probably more stock buybacks. So that was going to raise equity valuations. Um, this time around, I'd say like, you know, we can theorize and we might say, ah, see, my, my theory was right. Bitcoin went up 3% after Trump got elected or something. I don't know. I mean, even the election results, man, I'll be honest, like I usually can get a good sentiment of like how people are feeling. The one thing I'm sensitive is there's just so much divide in the U.S. right now. It's it's very painful. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's kind of more independent, I like to I understand there's nuance in things. I like to think through things and have genuine discussions like this. Uh, there was a documentary that I just recently watched that's trending very much on, on Netflix, which is called The Social Dilemma. I, I can recommend, man, to Quinn, to you, anyone who can watch it, please watch that because it will show you like what social media is doing right now to possibly be used as kind of a way to divide people. I used to be honest, I used to think that that narrative of like being able to use social media, it's like, ah, you know, for me personally, like I go on a feed and stuff and then I usually close off and stuff. But I think for a lot of people who get kind of trapped in social media, it could definitely sway your opinion and, and make you feel like to one extreme or the other in this case. And that's what I think you're seeing with the video footage in the US with the riots and stuff like that this is just going to escalate and become a bigger problem yeah. no matter how the election goes in this case which is what i think markets should be pricing and whether it be for bitcoin or, or equities it's going to be bad either way yeah yeah i think so too and 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 to be really honest with you um i i don't like both of the candidates again <laughs> i mean i i don't know i i don't think any of them is like a good a good option for the for the us mm -hmm. and and to bring back like uh, the peace in the country and yeah, and unite people again because like I think that the world has never been this divided before because of actually stuff happening in the US. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's even like having a big impact here in Europe as well. Um, so yeah, uh, it's not it's not good and and I yeah we'll see what what the impact will be, but. I don't think any of the options are very good and I'm actually pretty scared that um, the markets will react uh, negatively to to the outcome anyway. Mm -hmm. Whether it's like Trump winning or, or Biden winning, I think the, the markets will not react very well to it. But that's yeah. my opinion. I'll tell you, as you mentioned, Quentin, I don't think these are the best candidates we could bring to the stage and stuff. It's weird. like. Over the last two or three elections, it became really apparent mm -hmm. that like we, we weren't putting up the best options. 
And the the thing is, uh, there's a term for it. It's called, um, and the same goes with the, how the media has gotten le- like uh, worse over time. How everything has just seemed to kind of like uh, normalize like the extreme or like the craziness of the world. Yeah. It's a term called hyper normalization. And I watched a documentary that kind of kind of defined it into context. But how we just kind of begin to tolerate things like like seeing people protesting, do stuff like that, and like or not just protesting. That's that's fine, I guess, but like the riots and like the yeah, clashes yeah. and the extremes, it becomes the norm. And it almost kind of forces you to say, hey, like, which one do you side with? And it's like, well, maybe I don't sign with either of those. Like that's that's not most Americans. It's not most people. And it's like, it's real painful to see, man. And to see that it's having, as you mentioned, ramifications, because the US is so large and stuff as a country and very impactful in the world. Yeah. To see that it's affecting other regions is just, it, I think it shows you that we, we all share one problem right now. And that's that we're we're very antisocial uh, by the the consumption of social media. Um, just think about, I mean, we were talking, Quentin, about like Twitter. I mean, man, like it, the the thing is the crypto space itself can be toxic sometimes and the whole space yeah. can, yeah. I mean, again, I think all in all, the major thing I would say here is that we need to more than anything come together, be more rational and and probably step away from the computer every once in a while. Yeah. Just see see what it's sunny outside. It's but it's hard with all these vegetable projects. Like yeah, we, need to, yeah. we need to research. Yeah. yeah, so I need to be at my computer so I can go farming in yeah. that case, because I'm a yield farmer. <laughs> exactly. Anyways. No, no, but you're totally right, man. Um I totally agree with that. We need some more some more peace and some more love towards each other and, and be like accepting each other each other because like like you mentioned twitter it's getting worse and worse as well maybe it's because i'm i'm using it more than i used to um but it's also getting worse and worse and i really just want people to be like yeah to understand each other's point of view and and to respect other opinions and it's it seems so hard it it's not only twitter but it's like the rest of the world as well as well like ev- nobody can like understand someone else anymore i mean like it's difficult to respect another opinion and to like talk about it in a friendly way and yeah i mean it's so sad to see and it's only it's not only twitter i mean like it's a good example for that um but uh, yeah you know the the sad thing is too quentin is that there's two problems uh with social media there actually was a study done i'll be honest i'm gonna probably scuff the numbers but it was somewhere in the ballpark range of like two percent of people on social media post like a vast majority of the social posts whether it be replies whether it be posts like vocal opinions on political topics um even in the crypto space a very sick few people posting the opinion pieces being the most vocal replying to every post making people feel like what's the narrative here like what are people saying um and it leads to these very extreme opinions Mm -hmm. on both sides of any kind of issue being really harsh really rude where most people like maybe like you and i if we weren't content creators we'd probably be very passive we just kind of listen to what people are saying and read posts i know i do that even as a as a content creator um and the second worst thing of all in regards to a lot of these topics is they're not actually substance like there's no substance in these debates um it's my coin over your coin Right. So it's not like, hey, like, what does your protocol do? Like, why do you like your coin? Like, it's just constant barbarianism and, 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 and tribalism in mm-hmm. this case. So uh, to me, I, I don't, I, I just, I've built almost a native ability in my head just to ignore it and to just only listen to people who I know productively, like yourself, are doing great things for the space and actually are here for the long term. It's, it's something you build up over the years, I guess, being in crypto. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But yeah, uh, Nick, I think um, we're going to wrap it up because it's nearly one hour. I think the people wow, have man. like <laughs> a lot to to listen to, but I think it was super interesting. Uh, it was amazing to talk to you again. Uh, so yeah, thank you a lot for your time, man. When it was an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on and I uh, would love to have you on the channel anytime. My pleasure. All right, Nick, um, I will put your link to your to your website of Digifox and um, your channel in the description down below. So for the people who don't follow uh, Nicholas yet, I would say go subscribe to um, to Data Dash to his channel. There is a link in the description down below. And also check out Digifox, his new product. It's amazing. Um, you will definitely like it. Give it a try. Uh, so yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I see you next video. Cheers. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.